everybody. My name is Casey Shipman and I am the program coordinator for Instant Israel at CJE Senior Life. So today we're going to be continuing our Shakespeare 101 journey and we're going to be looking at one of the most well-known shows of Shakespeare, which would be Romeo and Juliet. So most likely you've seen um, this story in some form or another. So what I'm gonna do is give kind of a quick synopsis of the play for those who don't remember all the details or if you've never seen it or maybe haven't read it since back in high school, who knows. Um, so I'm gonna give you kind of an idea of the show, talk a little bit about reinterpretations and remakes of it in modern day, and then we're going to watch a screening of a, another famous version of Romeo and Juliet. So hope you enjoy this program. So first, I wanna mention something that Shakespeare is very famous for, which is his iambic pentameter, which is a way of, a form of writing, a form of poetry. Um, you think of haikus and things like that. This is kind of another style of writing. And it's unique for a couple different reasons. So when Shakespeare wrote his plays, characters had different ways of speaking. So one of the main things, the main um, ways to tell different characters apart, different social classes, commoners, or you know today, middle class, lower class people would speak in prose. So kind of the way you think of everyday speak. There isn't really a particular style or flow to it. It's just nonstop talking. <laughs> versus high society people, so specific characters that he had, you know, royalty and dukes and princes and things like that, would speak in iambic pentameter, this, you know, beautiful, flowy, patterned speech, which kind of symbolizes, you know, one way of living versus another. The other thing that's unique about this way of writing is that it follows the breath and the heartbeat. There's, there's this kind of internal rhythm to it. So when I took acting classes um, in school, when we studied Shakespeare, we would have to write out all of his um, poems and monologues and things like that and go through it and figure out this pattern of speaking and, and kind of chant together in this way of, um, this way of writing. But actually, nowadays, when you see Shakespeare, you don't really notice this pattern. It's more kind of internalized as a way of giving emphasis in your, in your thoughts as an actor in Shakespeare. It's not necessarily speaking this way that our heartbeat goes, but it's, um, it's more of an internal clock. So if we look at an example, we, uh, look at this scene when uh, Romeo and Juliet first meet at the party and Romeo says have not saints lips and holy palmers too. So that's how we would just say it in everyday speak but the way Shakespeare wrote it in this iambic pentameter this heartbeat rhythm would be have not saints lips and holy palmers too. So that's how they would all speak everything which would be <laughs> difficult to do, right? But it's symbolic and it's at this internal clock. So back in Shakespeare's day, that might've been how they were speaking. But nowadays, it's much more natural and organic and flowy. Um, so another example, not from Shakespeare, that you could try using iambic pentameter, something like, I'm hungry and I want dinner now. I'm hungry and I want my dinner now. So if you wanted to try something like that, it's just 10 syllables and you follow this heartbeat rhythm to it. Or you could tap on your knee, you could snap. Snapping might be tricky, <laughs> but you get the idea. So it's this very rhythmic poetry that he was really, really well known for. That, Again, long story short, that is still present today, but not as noticeable. So
So to get into the story of Romeo and Juliet, it's set in Verona. Um, the prologue is an opportunity for the friar who's kind of the narrator or the um, host, if you will, throughout the, sh the show who kind of asides to the audience and keeps us, tells things how it is and, and brings people together um, and keeps the story moving, tells us kind of exactly what's going to happen in the show. You know, he lays out, there are these two families, the Montagues and the Capulets, who have had this feud going on forever. But the action, you know, what changes this years-long feud is one child from each family falls in love with the other. These star-crossed lovers, if you will. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, there's a sad ending, um, self-inflicted death and violence. So, you know, you kind of get a synopsis of the, of the show before it even begins with this prologue from the friar. But when the action starts, the first thing that happens is we have some servants from each family seeing each other on the street and they start fighting. Romeo's cousin, Benvolio, tries to stop the fighting, but then uh, Lord Capulet's nephew, Tybalt, who plays a big role in kind of the downfall of the show, uh, challenges, um, is challenged to a fight by Benvolio, Romeo's cousin. So then they start fighting and the Prince of Verona, Prince Aeschylus, comes in, breaks up the fight and forbids any more of this fighting. He's done with the feud and says that the families have to have to break up the feud upon pain of death. There's no, there's gonna be no more of this. So that's kind of where, where we start the show is seeing how dramatic and hateful these families are toward each other. Um, Benvolio comes across his cousin, Romeo, who is lovesick over this woman, Rosaline, who isn't returning his affections. So that's kind of where he is at the beginning of the show. He's mopey and he's, you know, heartbroken and sad for this woman. Lord Capulet uh, gives Paris, Count Paris, permission to court his daughter, Juliet, at the Capulet's party that they have that night. So Juliet's dad is, is giving this guy, the Count, permission to marry her, to take, you know, take her into his home. And that's his plan for his daughter. Lady Capulet tells Juliet what the plans are and she's a good obedient daughter and agrees to, you know, meet him, let him court her that night. Ben, meanwhile, Benvolio and Romeo learn about this party and they decide more or less that they're going to kind of crash it. They've heard that Rosaline, this woman that Romeo loves, is going to be there, so they're going to sneak in. Romeo, once they get there, kind of confesses his reluctance. He's had a lot of really ominous dreams that he feels like this might be a foreboding situation. His friend Mercutio, who's with them, teases him and talks about this woman, Queen Mab, this fairy of nightmares that has actually, it's kind of a small piece of the show, but this, char this fictional character that has this one little piece in the show has expanded far beyond this little moment. There's all kinds of poetry and artistry and works that expand on who this Queen Mab really is and different interpretations of her, which is kind of interesting that this, this one paragraph character really took off. So at the, um, at the party, Tybalt sees Romeo and he wants to confront him, but Lord Capulet tells him, you know, not yet, not today kind of thing. You know, you were just told that <laughs> you guys will be killed if you fight him, so let's hold off. Romeo and Juliet, of course, meet at the party and they instantly fall in love. And then 
both of them find out what families they come from. So very dramatic start to their, their meeting. In act two, we see uh, Romeo leave the party and he goes to kind of think and ponder about this new love. <laughs> he very quickly has forgotten about Rosaline um, in the Capulet's garden. Meanwhile, Juliet is on the balcony of this garden um, thinking about Romeo and they're kind of both off in their own worlds thinking about each other. But eventually Romeo uh, reveals himself and the two of them profess their love to each other. Um, Julia tells Romeo the next day that she'll send a message about marriage plans. So moving very quickly, but that's the drama of Shakespeare, right? And of love in general, it's, it's always high drama. Um, Romeo confides to Friar Lawrence, who we saw at the beginning of the show that kind of laid out this story, to help him, help them get married, hoping to, um, hoping to end the feud between the two families. The Friar sees this as an opportunity to bring them together. So he's very supportive of this relationship. The next morning, Romeo instructs Juliet's nurse to tell Juliet to go to the Friar, who will join them in marriage that afternoon. So they're working through between Friar Lawrence and Juliet's nurse to kind of pass messages back and forth to make their wedding arrangements. Um, when she learns of Romeo's proposal, Juliet leaves for the Friar and they go off and get married. In act three, and usually when you see Shakespeare now, the first half of, usually there's an intermission, the first half of the show will be acts one through three, and then the second half will be um, four through five. Usually there are five acts in Shakespeare. So Tybalt is still in, still upset about seeing the Montagues at the party, and he decides to go confront them about it. So he's looking for Romeo and he finds Benvolio and Mercutio instead. And they start fighting. <laughs> when Romeo shows up, when Romeo shows up, Tybalt challenges him to a duel. But Romeo at this point, you know, now, now they're family. Nobody else knows that, it's a secret. But he knows, you know, now you're my family. I, I don't want any part of this, I love you kind of thing. And Mercutio is very confused by this, obviously, and so he steps in to fight him instead. When Romeo tries to intercede in the fight, Mercutio is uh, mortally wounded and he dies. And then all bets are off. Romeo kind of goes into a blind rage and kills Tybalt. Then he knows he's in trouble and he goes back to the friar to tell him what's happened. The prince decides, he's a very, very nice lenient guy who gives people a lot of chances. He uh, says he won't kill Romeo, but he's going to banish him forever. And if he comes back to Verona, he will be killed. So um, Juliet is meanwhile at home. She's waiting for, waiting to see Romeo and her nurse informs her of Tybalt's murder and of what happened and of Romeo being banished. So the nurse offers to bring Romeo to her. Meanwhile, Friar Lawrence informs Romeo of his banishment and advises him to go see Juliet one last time, then go, you know, leave Verona until the friar can reveal the marriage and kind of mend things. And Romeo agrees, so he goes. Uh, to see Juliet. Meanwhile, back at the Capulet's house, uh, Paris offers to marry Juliet, and they set, uh, Juliet's father and Paris set the date for three days from now. Romeo and Juliet in the morning say goodbye to each other, and Lady and Lord Capulet come into her room moments later and inform her that she's supposed to, she's going to marry Paris. Obviously she refuses because the this, this secret is still going on. She knows, well, I'm already married. Um, so she says no, and the parents are very upset. 
her father says he's going to disown her. So Julia goes to seek counsel from the friar. So this is kind of where we end, that Romeo has left, he's banished. Um, Juliet is now being told she has to marry this man she doesn't love. Mercutio has just been killed. So there's a lot of drama at the height of this, um, this point in the show. So you can pretend to take a little intermission, you know, go off and get a little glass of wine or, you know, buy some candy at concessions, take a little break um, and come back to see how the rest of the story unfolds. So Juliet goes to see the friar and she, uh, you know, is obviously very upset. She talks about killing herself. The friar persuades her instead to follow this plan that he has um, put into play or that he has come up with. So he tells her, go home, say that you'll marry Paris. And then the night before the wedding, drink this potion and it'll put you into a dead like state and people will think that you've died. And then I'll bring Romeo back and he'll take you safely you know, out of Verona until the friar can get the families together and tell them what's what's been happening. So she does so, she goes home, she agrees to marry Paris and her dad kind of, you know, she doesn't change her mind again, decides, well, let's move the wedding up to tomorrow <laughs> just to be safe. So she goes to her room and is obviously really anxious about taking this potion, you know, trusting that it's not gonna kill her. So she takes it and the next morning, um, her nurse discovers her body. They go to Friar Lawrence who arranges, you know, the funeral and instructs the family on what to do just, you know, as part of his plan. Part of his plan, the Friar Lawrence, was that another friar was supposed to find Romeo and tell him um, about the plan, tell him Juliet's not really dead, um, this is all part of this bigger plan, here's what's gonna happen. But instead he finds out from someone who doesn't know the situation that she's dead. And so of course now his life is over and the plan falls apart. So he goes and buys poison to kill himself too. Um, the other friar, Friar John, who was supposed to send the message along, could not get to fr uh, could not get to Romeo. He tells Friar Lawrence, you know, the plan didn't work. I I didn't see him. Uh, he doesn't know what's happening. So Friar Lawrence is so much drama, right? <laughs> Only Shakespeare. So Friar Lawrence rushes to the tomb, Juliet's tomb, um, assuming that Romeo will be there. When Romeo, so he's on his way there. When Romeo gets to the tomb, to Juliet's tomb, and she's been buried, Paris is there, but it's night, so he doesn't recognize, he doesn't know Paris is Paris. So the two of them fight, and Romeo kills Paris before realizing who he is. He enters the tomb, to Juliet's tomb, and he drinks his own poison, and he actually dies. Then, poor timing, the friar shows up right after this. And again, more poor timing, Juliet wakes up right after this happens. So the friar tells Juliet to, to run away and Juliet is set on, you know, killing herself too, to be with Romeo in another life. So after all of these horrible, tragic, sad deaths, the families and the prince are summoned and the friar tells them the whole story, everything that happened, what his plan really was. And he you know, accepts death as a punishment, but the prince says, you know, this isn't your fault. This, is, this all stemmed from these two families, you know, hating each other so much that these kids couldn't, couldn't um, you know, have a life together. So the two families vow to um, absolve the feud and build statues in their kids' memories. 
and um, and that's how it ends. It's uh, not really a happy ending because we have um, the main characters have killed themselves, and it's really sad. But on the other hand, there's a little bit of light at the tunnel because um, the friar actually was able to bring families together even through tragedy. So, like I said, this is a super well-known piece of Shakespeare. High drama, you know, young love, fights, duels, you know, killings, it's um, poison, you know, there's so much, so much going on. So it, it shouldn't be surprising that this story has been turned into lots of other stories with the same kind of, um, the same kind of main message of star-crossed love, you know, or two people who shouldn't be together against all odds have fallen in love with each other. So, of course, we all know West Side Story, an incredible musical, um, where we see, you know, Tony and Maria from two different walks of life, two different ethnicities that at the time did not get along, in rival gangs, um, falling in love with each other, great musical, you know, lots of drama, tragedy. Um, but that's, you know, of course, a classic remake of, of um, Romeo and Juliet. Another is this uh, film called Zebra Head, which is set in Detroit, Michigan, and it's about an interracial couple. So instead of two kind of feuding families in Verona, it's two different races, which already add, you know, their own historic and different challenges to a relationship between um, a white teenage boy and a black teenage girl. And then, you know, the drama that ensues in um this was a recent film in you know the day and time and in the setting and between their different cultures and then we have this other one um called solomon and gaynor which is a welsh film about an orthodox jewish man who falls in love with a um a christian woman um which is also a different take on you know two different people from two different religions um, falling in love and trying to work through how to make it work. A couple other interesting interpretations are um, Shakespeare in Love, which is a pretty well-known movie as well. Um, it's kind of an imaginary love affair that Shakespeare has with um, one of his actresses while writing Romeo and Juliet. So it's supposed to be the imaginary inspiration for, uh, for the show. Then we have uh, Nomo and Juliet, which is a gnome with a, an O on the end, um, which is an animated movie. Uh, two the two characters are separated by a garden fence, and there's a feud between blue gnomes and red gnomes. So a different interpretation where it's creatures who are different colors, which you could look at as you know different races, maybe different backgrounds. Um, and they fall in love with each other through this little fence, um, <laughs> being uh, from different families. And then we have um, West Bank Story, which is a parody of West Side Story. It takes place in um, Israel, and it follows the romance between these two kids who are owners of, uh, relatives of owners of rival restaurants, um, a falafel restaurant, and uh, two rival falafel restaurants in Israel and across the border in Palestine. So people have taken lots of different kind of creative liberties in retelling the story of Romeo and Juliet. Um, but I have to say personally, my all-time favorite is West Side Story. So without further ado, you know, now that you've got your wine and your candy, <laughs> you're all ready to go settled in. Um, we will settle into our seats and watch a screening of West Side Story, which is um, a, an incredible, very well-written reinterpretation of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Thank you for joining us today. For more videos just like this one, be sure to visit www.cje.net forward slash cyber club.